Hello and welcome to the Empower Couples Podcast, where here you get modern, non-boring relationship advice for you and your partner to communicate like pros, fight smarter, and stay on the same team no matter the challenge that you face. I am one of your hosts, Aaron Freeman. And I'm Jocelyn Freeman, but you all just know us as The Freemans. This episode is about how your sex life can be impacted by hormonal imbalances and other lifestyle factors your doctor doesn't tell you with our special guest, Dr. Sabrina Solt. Okay, this is week two of the three-part series to spice up your sex life. And hopefully you heard the first episode in the series last week with Ashley. You must listen to that after this one if you haven't already. And we wanted to have this naturopathic doctor. That's what she does. She is a full-time naturopathic doctor with a booming practice. And people come to her for many different things, from regenerative medicine to just aging pains and aches. But she's also a genius in biohacking and what leads to your hormones thriving. And you're going to hear throughout the episode some very real lifestyle factors many of which you're probably doing, sorry to say it, but your doctor has not told you about these, right? And you're gonna hear part of why in the episode, we're gonna go into hormonal imbalances that could really be affecting you 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. So really any age range that you fall into, you're gonna hear things that you could be doing that are impacting your sex life and how you can change it. So let's dive into this amazing episode. Well, Sabrina, thank you so much for being here today and sharing about your knowledge and wisdom. Well, I am honored to be here. Thank you guys so much. Well, before we dive into these fun kind of questions about how our hormones are changing throughout our lifespan, what? <laughs> they do change. They do? Yes. <laughs> uh, how that can impact our sex life. I think it would be helpful for the audience to connect with you a little personally because you're a mom, you are an entrepreneur, and you're a wife. And so with all of those things going on, like you're running a successful business, you've got two great kids, how is your sex life? Is it going well? <laughs> um, I would, so we have sex almost every day. Oh my gosh. Swear wow. to God. Swear to God. Um, some days it's a little more exciting than others, um, but for the most part, we really do try to prioritize that intimacy. Um, just because there was a point in time, not that we were that we weren't having sex, but where it was more of a strain on us, and we were just kind of approaching the subject as a to do list item versus like a thing that we get to do. So that became a really big reframe for us, just in our in our intimate lives, and when it became more of like this is an opportunity. This is a get to, this is a fun thing. Um, it's just, it, it's something that we look forward to. It's just a part of our day. Well, and one more kind of logistics question, if you don't mind, because again, you've got these kids and you're so attentive to them and, and there's a lot that that requires a, people go, well, we don't have the time. So how do you find the time then? Oh yeah. And you're running your own practice. Yeah, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, we're not having marathons, <laughs> but so yeah, it does. We're not sitting in the room for hours or anything like that on end. Um, we, we try to be efficient in that regard because yes, we do have two little kids, and uh, thankfully they're at the ages now where we can sneak away into another room for like ten minutes and have that special time together, and they're not gonna, you know do anything super crazy. Uh, for the most part, we try to sneak it in if they're napping. Um, our older one, thankfully, you know, she's, she's four and a half, so she can entertain herself really, really easily. And the little guy, he still takes one or two naps a day. So we just kind of try to like aim the timing around when it's convenient and it's, it seems to work. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing. I, I think it's important that people hear successes like that and that it is, just a matter of creativity and prioritizing it. Like that's the key word I'm hearing there. So thanks for sharing that with the audience. Of before course. We... <laughs> <laughs> well, diving into your specialty, your expertise as a doctor, and you hear from people of all ages, of all walks of life, and a lot of different things going on. I think the first question is, you know, do you find that both men and women are equally impacted by changes in their hormones? A thousand percent, yes. And it kind of happens a little bit differently for both men and women. 
And uh, for men, it's the male testosterone that we're going to talk about when it comes to men. It's that's like the main thing that's driving their hormones. It's the testosterone. It's not so much the estrogen as well as the progesterone like women have. So testosterone production can decrease in men starting in their early 30s. And this is usually a result of things like toxicity buildup over time, as well as things like poor diet, alcohol consumption, amongst other things. For women, we do start to get changes in our hormones kind of around the same time period, like 25 to 30. And it's not technically perimenopause or, of course, not even menopause yet. We know that most women don't get there until much later. But the things things just can kind of start to break down. And for similar reasons as men, right, we're just not getting adequate nutrition. Exercise might not be there. There's various other things, even gut dysfunction that can start to attack this stuff. So if anybody's even had, you know, any meaningful amount of antibiotics in their youth or in throughout their life, that can damage the gut, which can then damage hormone production. So there's so many things that can cause these changes that when we're starting to look at patients with their hormones and what's actually going on and we're pulling these labs, so much of the investigative work to actually get people back in a very sustainable and a very appropriate level means looking at all these other factors that they have going on in their lives. So treatment plans aren't always one size fits all. That's such a great point. And I'm really thinking about, okay, those are the contributing factors. What's going to be the signal to me as a male or a female, and you could probably give yeah, different do the answers male, as well. I'll ask, yeah. Uh, yeah, so for the male, there could be for a lot of couples, this thought of, okay, well, I'm just not feeling it anymore, or I don't have the drive or different even things about how interactions have gone. You know, maybe I don't feel respected. So that could be a whole world for me of why, let's say my the sex life has sort of declined. But what's going to be the signal to me like, oh, this might actually be hormonal. Well, you kind of hit it on there with the lack of the drive, the lack of the discipline, the lack of motivation, the just not feeling like yourself anymore. Maybe you aren't sleeping as well as you used to, or you're waking up and you're still feeling tired. You're dragging throughout your day. Maybe you aren't getting erections as easily, and maybe they're not lasting for the duration of intercourse. Those are kind of the top things for guys in addition to just weight gain. A lot of the time when guys' hormones start decreasing, they start getting that, you know, quote unquote, dad bod that people like to say, where mm-hmm. it's mainly some more fat being deposited around the midsection. Maybe they're losing some muscle tone and they don't even have the energy to even get themselves to the gym at that point to even start making a difference. So it's kind of kind of end up in this cycle that perpetuates itself. That's huge. And what about for women? Like what would be the signal for me? Because I could just blame it on, well, I'm overwhelmed with the kids or I'm, you know, I just don't think we have time. So what would be the physical signals that something hormonal could be going on? For women. So for women, we got to kind of differentiate between just hormones going down when we're in that pre-menopause or perimenopause state versus uh, when a woman hits menopause. So for somebody who's younger, say in their 30s or 40s or even early 50s, before the big change happens. Generally speaking, it's that decrease in energy where you just don't have that get up and go anymore. And one of the other really interesting things that I see for women is this type of memory loss and this type of cognitive dysfunction that presents as like, oh, what's that word I was just thinking of? Or, oh, I walked into this room, what do I have to do? Or, oh, I really know that I have to get this thing done on my to-do list, but I can't physically bring my body to do it. And it's just this low level, almost blah, where you don't feel like yourself, but you know that deep down there's that part of you that still has the desire to do these things. It's almost like your body is like this wheel stuck in the mud and you just can't get that grip to get moving forward. Wow. I mean, it, it seems like people really have to be kind of in tune with themselves, but also honest with themselves. And I think that there can be some like shame or embarrassment wrapped around, like really looking at if something is biologically going on. Do you find that people like number one are maybe hesitant or resistant to address if something biological is going on? I think that's a, it, it definitely happens. And I think this, this is actually a bigger conversation about how people don't even live in their bodies a lot of the time. A lot of the time people are just so set on their automatic behaviors and habits and the way that they go about their day that by the time things actually decrease to any meaningful amount, it's very hard for them to really kind of catch up. And I do think that a lot of the time too, 
patients are existing or people are existing in the traditional medical model where they go to their doctor for maybe their once yearly physical, the doctor maybe pulls a couple of labs that are relatively meaningless when we're talking about a functional perspective and a functional approach to medicine, and they tell the patient that they're fine, and then they go on their way, and the patient still wonders why they've gained 20 pounds in the last year, why their hair is falling out, why they have no energy, and yet nobody's giving them any meaningful answers. Mm. So it's it, they're also being told by you know the people that they trust, this, this doctor that's in a position of authority, that they're fine, but yet their lived experience is telling them something completely different. Mm. That's, this is so important. I like specifics, right? Would you mind saying what is something that the traditional medicine or the traditional doctor would tell you that's not very meaningful and what would be more meaningful for them to actually know about not only their overall physical health, but hormone levels and libido, like what should they be hearing? Oh gosh, let's go. Let's take a couple of examples actually, because um, this is, this is super important. So for women in general, the your OBGYN or your family doctor won't even test something like your testosterone levels. And women actually need testosterone in really meaningful amounts for that libido for sure. And also for energy production, for discipline, for their joints to feel good. That's the number one thing. And then also thyroid. Women's thyroid issues get so overlooked because doctors in the traditional model, they'll really only order a TSH. And TSH is your thyroid stimulating hormone. So this is the signal that tells your thyroid to release thyroid hormone, and it actually comes from the pituitary gland. Now, when thyroid hormone gets released, it first is in the version called T4, which is the inactive version. Your body then has to convert it to the T3, which is the active version. And the active version, the T3, is the one that actually does all of the work. So that actually tells us, hey, is your thyroid functional or not? Do you have enough of the active thyroid hormone coursing through your body to do things like keep your weight down, keep your temperature regulated, keep your bowels moving, keep your skin temperature good, right? Women who come in all the time and their feet and their hands are freezing and yet no one's looking at their thyroid appropriately. So that's one one example just for for women. Hmm. When we talk about men, here's two main things that I see. One, testosterone levels. So guys will get their testosterone checked and it'll come back at say three or 400 and their doctor will tell them your testosterone is normal. Now, the quote unquote normal range for testosterone for men is anywhere, I think, from like 216 to upwards of 1100. That's a massive range. Yeah. Right. So now to say that something is normal is not to say that it is optimal. When we're talking about something like what's the optimal range for testosterone, we actually want it between 900 and 1100. So if a guy is sitting at three to 400, yeah, he might be in a normal range, but he's a third of what should be optimal. And he's going to usually be symptomatic at that point. Sometimes guys actually even lose erectile dysfunctions when they hit about 300 with their testosterone. So anything lower than that, well, now you're probably compromising some of their relational abilities, right? The other thing with men that gets really under my skin, and this is is kind of a soapbox of mine, (laughs) is the whole cholesterol myth. And so guys will go to their doctor and they'll get a cholesterol panel done. And something like the LDL cholesterol might be high. Now, there's other things to look at when it comes to a cholesterol panel. And right now in the traditional medical model, the whole idea of cholesterol and high cholesterol is actually just based on what's called the lipid hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. It's not an actual factual thing. But the lipid hypothesis is a really great way to sell statin medication, which is the cholesterol lowering medication. So they'll look at the cholesterol and they'll see the LDL, which is the quote unquote bad cholesterol, and it might be elevated, but it doesn't tell us what that elevated LDL is doing. It doesn't tell us if it's inflammatory. It doesn't tell us if it's oxidative. They also don't really pay attention to the HDL, which is the quote unquote good cholesterol. Now, if the LDL is up, but the HDL is up and the triglycerides are down, it's actually not a problem. It actually means your body is making enough LDL to actually do heal and repair because plot twist, cholesterol is actually a healing molecule in the body in addition to being the precursor for all of your hormones. Mm -hmm. So we get these patients in here and they've got hormone disruption and some high cholesterol because their body's trying to pick up the slack. And here these doctors are giving them these prescriptions for these cholesterol lowering medications, perpetuating the problem even further. Wow. Um, I mean, it's just like everyone needs to like be able to talk to a doctor like you. We don't, have to, maybe, to do. we don't have to go further, but like the question I'm left with is 
these doctors know that, right? Well, not usually. So a lot of this, um, this approach in the functional world, in the naturopathic world, we learn this, we understand this, we can spend more than five minutes with our patients and we're not relegated mm -hmm. to just what the insurance company tells us we have to do or relegated to just getting a prescription, right? So yes, we know this. Now, should other doctors know this? Absolutely. There's actually a plethora of regular trained MDs all over the interwebs and the YouTube um, who, who will teach this stuff, who will talk more openly about this stuff. So yes, there is a population that does know, but for the most part, a lot of doctors just haven't left that old paradigm. All right, couples, we want to pop in here for a second and make sure that you heard about the May only opportunity to attend an online workshop with Ashley Jones. She was the guest speaker from last week, and we know that she blew your mind going into what creates desire and wanting for each other and what are some of the real blocks getting in the way. Now, imagine having more time with her where she leads you through exercises that make a difference. You're gonna learn things about something called power dynamics and power play, which has honestly made such a difference in our intimacy already. You're gonna get truth bombs about what is really blocking your sex life that we didn't have time to go into in the podcast. And also understanding the energetics that create desire. And maybe what are some of the things you're doing unconsciously that are leading to the opposite effect of you not desiring each other. Now, don't worry, you're not going to be asked to do anything uncomfortable on camera and you don't have to share anything private. And also, if you can't attend the live date, you are able to watch the recording and have access to that for life. Now, the thing is, if we opened the gates for everyone to attend, it would simply be too big. So there are only a couple ways to qualify for this. Number one, all of our private clients are getting access. And the only other way is that you purchase our communication mastery bundle, which is going to greatly benefit your relationship anyway. It has incredible communication and conflict principles that we aren't able to do on the podcast as well. So go to onlinecouplesworkshops.com slash communication bundle. That link will also be in the show notes. And you're going to have this incredible bundle of information all about communication and conflict and get free access to the intimacy workshop with Ashley Jones. All right, let's head back to the interview. Mm, okay. I was hoping at least it wasn't insidious. So, okay. At least <laughs> if, it's not, if it's not being intentional, it's just kind of like they don't really pay mm -hmm. attention to it. Okay. A little bit better, but definitely get what you're saying. I, I'm learning so much. I'm really appreciating this this shift already. Yeah. So, okay. I think people hearing this so far getting, okay, men, I'm seeing, you know, what it would look like if I'm experiencing a decline. Same thing for women. Okay. I realize that maybe my doctor is not going to test things as accurately as they should be. Now, I want to go to testing and like what could people request in a few minutes, but let's go into some of those lifestyle factors because again, we will just hear kind of these list of reasons. Well, we, we don't have time for downtime or relaxation because we're, we're busy. We're this, right? Like people kind of almost feel trapped by their lives and feeling busy, but I'd love if you could elaborate, like what are some lifestyle changes that both men and women could make? Maybe they're different that would help naturally support their hormone levels. And maybe it's different, like depending on ages, if you want to address that too. Yeah, so you actually kind of were touching on a couple few couple different things in just the way that you were phrasing that question, which I think is going to be a, kind of an important um, way to frame this answer, is that we need three main ingredients for optimal sexual function. We need those adequate hormone levels. We also need an adequate functioning nervous system, and we need adequate blood flow. So we kind of touched on the hormone picture as well, and then you were kind of leading into it with the nervous system function. So when it comes to both arousal and ejaculation or orgasm in both men and women, it involves both parts of the nervous system. So for your listeners that might not know, our central nervous system, which comes from our brain throughout our spinal cord, it has two different parts. It has the parasympathetic part and the sympathetic part. And so parasympathetic begins with P. We're going to associate P and point, and we're going to associate sympathetic S with shoot. So we're going to associate point with that initial arousal. So for men, that's obviously going to be achieving an erection. For women, that's obviously going to be getting some lubrication and getting, of course, just some overall stimulation in the genital region. 
So that parasympathetic state has to occur for that initial level of arousal to happen. And the parasympathetic state is also known as our rest and digest state. Wait, so, we, so hold on, just to intervene. So are yeah. you saying people need to be somewhat relaxed yes. to get turned on? <laughs> yes, they do. This is why it's so easy for guys to get a morning erection because they're waking in that relaxed state, right? Uh-huh. It's 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 kind of obvious when you think about it like that, but yeah, we have to be able to to kind of tune into our bodies and be able to turn off that stress response or to to initiate some sort of relaxation to be able to get into this arousal state. And I will tell you my most, like my best trick for women, and this has never failed me. And throughout all my patients, all my recommendations never failed. Reading erotica. Mm. It allows you to go into enough of a rest of state while still stimulating your mind in, in an erogenous way that it will absolutely stimulate some degree of arousal. Like it has never failed. So I totally I recommend that. that. I, I can really get that when I, you know, reading Fifty Shades of Grey was interesting. <laughs> yes, and yes, and most women have done that. So you you understand that that process is going to happen. Mm-hmm. So Jocelyn jumped in there with that great Re- commentary on needing to be rested for men. That was the point. Was there something else on the shoot, by the way? Yes. So this is an interesting thing. So. Your, your body actually has to transition from that rest and digestive state during the actual act of intercourse. And it actually has to build up enough to transition to the sympathetic state, which is literally your fight or flight state in order for ejaculation or orgasm to happen. And this is for both men and women, right? So there has to be, your body has to still also now be able to get into a purposeful stressed state. Now, we start to see some hiccups with this when you actually see people that are taking certain antidepressant medications. Their body will have a really difficult time getting to that achievement of orgasm state. Uh, There also is a couple other instances as well where people, maybe they relax too much, like with drinking alcohol, right? We've all heard the term whiskey, you know what, for, um, (laughs) right? And it's because their body is actually in too much of that rested state to be able to transition back to that sympathetic and that that fight or flight state. It makes so much sense. So I want to go back to this relaxation piece because, you know, I just, again, I just hear people say, well, I'm busy, I'm stressed. And especially I think women can just be like, go, go, go. So it's like, they've got their work day, then it's uh, kids stuff, then it's dishes, and they just are not relaxing before bedtime. And then people wonder why they're not, you know, turned on laying in bed, but also something, because I know we watch your lifestyle, you and your husband, you're big on technology and even just how light impacts us. And if you think about the average family, the average couple, what are they doing after dinner and cleanup? Watching TV, looking at their phones. And I just sometimes laugh, like, who gets really turned on doing that, right? Like, is, is it like, ooh, I'm feeling so sexy laying here doing this. So can you talk about even how technology can be impacting, like, Mm-hmm. not feeling relaxed, but then also your sex life. Right. Well, so you've, you've, you've never been in our house past, you know, the evening time, but so not only do we wear a uh, blue light blocker glasses, which if I'm just going to be entirely honest, are not sexy at all. <laughs> they, we, you kind of have like a Terminator look when you're wearing them, but they're really effective at kind of um, removing that stimulating blue light, which, which can be actually more of a cortisol inducing sort of state. Um, We can talk more about that in a second, but we actually have red lights in our house. So those come on when the sun goes down. So it's creating more of like this warm, uh, gentle environment. And the other thing too, with watching screens or anything in the evening. So your eyes are actually part of your brain. Like they are brain tissue. So you're literally sending this intense stimulation to directly to your brain during a time when you should be winding down. Um, so for the most part, we try to actually put technology away uh, once our red light glasses come on and just, again, trying to relax. We also eat dinner relatively early too, because this is going to allow our, again, our rest and digestive state to happen and going to, into that sympathetic or parasympathetic state in the evening after that dinner time. And then just, again, coming together and trying to make time for purposeful connection too. Yeah. Okay. That that's huge. And I think, you know, maybe everyone listening isn't going to be completely open to like the red lights or the blue light blocking glasses, even though they are helpful. I'm actually wearing them right now. I haven't gotten into the nighttime routine 
to be honest. But that even if they don't jump to do that yet, I think what I just heard in that is even just turn off technology and connect in bed instead or do something that's getting you relaxed. Like if you're hoping to be more intimate with your partner, you have to check out, are you creating opportunities for relaxing? Or are you just in a constantly stressed state and then you lay in bed and then you wonder why you're telling your partner you're not in the mood, right? So I think that relaxation piece is is important. Anything you want to jump in? Yeah. And one of the things that we actually do, and um, this is not a shameless plug for you guys or anything, but so if somebody wanted to listen to a cool podcast like this one, um, we actually listen to podcasts that we're both interested in at night as a way to connect. And that's actually led to some of our you know, best conversations uh, just as a couple, because we have that time together where we're both engaged in something, but also in a relaxed state. And it just, again, furthers that connection. So plug for this podcast to mm-hmm. listen to to further the connection i'm with it yeah. so <laughs> i'm also going back and making sure we're picking up everything that you're putting down so you mentioned hormones which we did cover nervous system did we get anything on the blood flow Ooh, blood flow this is arguably the one of the most important ones i mean they're all really important but you need blood flow for both arousal in male and female. Obviously with men, we know that the blood flow causes that engorgement, right? And the adequate functioning of the small vessels in the penis are what hold the blood in place and allow it to stay there for the duration of sexual activity. For women, a lot of people don't know this little tidbit, but female lubrication is actually an ultra filtrate of blood plasma, meaning blood flow has to go to that vaginal tissue and secrete across those membranes to produce lubrication. So arousal for women is at least a thousand percent blood flow, blood flow, blood flow. Like you have to have blood flow there. This is why foreplay is so important. Oh, wow. So I guess, I mean, the obvious question, I think even as a listener would be, well, shoot, what might be restricting blood flow? And then how can I more easily, or what are some of the things I can do to increase the blood flow? So... So blood flow, as far as nerves and arteries and veins, those three all travel together. So when we have more of that nervous system relaxation, we will actually get a reflex um, dilation of the neighboring blood vessels. It's going to allow the blood to go to that area. So the more you can relax, the more you can get that blood flow. Again, when we're in that parasympathetic state, that rest and digestive state, we're kind of opening the body's ability to send blood to different areas that need it. When we're in that sympathetic state or the fight or flight state, if we think about it, we have to like, we, this, this state was engineered so we could like run away from a tiger or something that was chasing us. So it's a very purposeful shunting of blood to areas that are going to get us like maximally out of danger, not necessarily to our regions for, you know, for pleasure. Right. So that's why, again, that parasympathetic, that rest of state is going to actually be more conducive to allowing that blood flow to enter those areas. It's, Mm. I mean, everything you're breaking down, I'm like this, why aren't we taught this? You know, like this is (laughs) so important and maybe people listening have been sitting there feeling a decline in their drive. And yes, they understand there's other, you know, contributing factors for their marriage. Maybe they're feeling a little emotionally disconnected, but in terms of like wanting to feel that desire and that want for sex, I think this is so important what you're hitting on. And Kind of a, a question maybe you maybe you've never been asked this before, but you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, Dr. John Gray. He brought up an interesting point in an interview I listened to where he said, you know, men with that testo- testosterone factor need to spend time around other men to also activate that. Like that's kind of one of the primal primal things we need to do. And then women also need time with women to balance their hormones. Is that something you also agree with? And and maybe speak to that a bit. I definitely agree with the men being around men thing. I think that there is a lost art of masculinity. And I think that a brotherhood is actually so important for male development, especially if a guy didn't grow up with a strong male figure in his life. Absolutely. And that's sort of like... That, that competition or that even just brotherhood amongst men, it will actually reflexively increase guys' testosterone levels. So friendly competition amongst guys. Um, and I think this is honestly one of the reasons, and this is a total aside, uh, why there are so many guys that are actually addicted to the gaming world. It's, it's that desire for that brotherhood. It's that desire for like the adventure and the conquering um, that they're seeking out 
in a in a fake sort of way versus in a real life way but that's a total aside but yes 100 percent with the guys and the brotherhood i am totally for that and and i even encourage it with with my husband for women i do think that it's important for women to have um conscious female friendships there is a lot of instances where women go into relationships with other women and it becomes less about um, a positive women's environment versus a spousal or a significant other bashing environment. And I've kind of seen both ends of it. And I am very much a proponent of honoring the sanctity of relationships and marriage and being the biggest support and the biggest love of your significant other. Um, that that's the type of relationship or that's the type of you know, environment that I would not want to be part of. And I encourage women that if that is something that you are exposed to, um, the, the kind of female toxicity when it comes to uh, their men or their significant others, that's something that I just wouldn't want to invite in because it can put an extra stress on the relationship. I 100% agree, right? Like there's a respectful way to share if things are happening in your relationship, but bashing and, and I can imagine that it's definitely not leading to more desire for your partner if you're just hearing negativity. And going back to the what you were making the remarks for men spending time with other men, you know, that often gets deprioritized because again, like the whole list of everything going on. But what you just said, if I were to add it all up, if your partner goes and spends time with other empowered men, and that's, I think, the key thing is that it is kind of, again, more meaningful, purposeful, like you said, friendly competition. It's not just sitting around and maybe having three pitchers of beers that that can actually benefit your relationship, right? Absolutely. It kind of allows the guy to come back to his significant other, to his family with fresh eyes fresh perspective. And I think it does allow more of a deeper appreciation for your home life. Um, I personally grew up with, uh, like my parents are married, happily married for, for many years. And uh, twice a year, my dad would go away on these week long hunting trips. And that was his, his man time, right? Literally just in a bush for weeks at a time, no showers, no phones, middle of nowhere, nothing hunting. And he always came back so happy. And him and my mom, I think that that's why they've been happy for literally decades together, because there was that very good distinction where he got to go and be a man. And he was always a really positive male influence in my life. And I don't doubt that that had anything to do with it. I think that's really huge. And and time apart can be really, really good for us. So we've covered a lot of ground here. I'm like actually realizing just even more how much of a genius you are. But I want to make sure, you know, you've talked about some lifestyle factors from, you know, sleep to, did you really address diet? I want to have a minute there. And then I also want to go to what can people request from either their doctor or what they can they do to get tested? So did you address diet yet? No, we should definitely touch on diet. So there's a few things uh, dietary wise that are going to tank hormones, tank blood flow, and even affect your nervous system. And again, I talk about these things, not from a dogmatic or a, you know, a strict rule perspective, but simply from a, okay, these things are negatively going to impact one or more of those three ingredients that we need for libido and arousal. So top things. And I kind of mentioned alcohol already, but that is a really, really big one. Uh, not only does it affect those the ingredients as far as the nervous system, the blood flow and the hormones, but it just doesn't generally make people nice people. So I'm going to just go ahead and say no alcohol for sure. Uh, sugar is also another really, really big one. Sugar is going to tank hormone production. It's also going to hurt blood flow. I mean, just look at diabetics and how they develop things like peripheral neuropathy because of the damage to the nerves and the blood vessels. Um, that's a really, really big one. And again, you don't have to be diabetic to actually experience the negative effects of excess sugar in the diet when it comes to uh, libido and bedroom performance. Seed oils are another really big one. So seed oils are actually the thing that's responsible for most of the cardiac inflammation that we see in the world as far as congestive heart disease and um, even the cholesterol issues go. It's the seed oils that are in restaurant food, um, things like canola oil, vegetable oil, safflower oil, peanut oil, soybean oil. All of those things. I do recommend if, if people want a good substitute, uh, grass-fed butter or beef tallow. Those are the best things to substitute for those um, negative cooking oils. Um, another thing is, so there's, there's a school of thought around dairy. 
Some people can tolerate dairy, some people can't. For the people who can't, it is super, super detrimental to your system because it's very damaging to the gut and it's very inflammatory for your cardiovascular system. So if you can't tolerate it, I would suggest staying away from it. If you can tolerate it, still try to minimize it because there is still research that supports how it's going to be contributing to unnecessary inflammation in the body. And then the last one that I usually like patients to stay away from is gluten. And this usually strikes a chord with people because everybody loves their products containing gluten. And not everybody is full-blown celiac as far as having an autoimmune disorder that prevents them from eating, uh, from eating things that contain gluten. But gluten in and of itself as a molecule will always tell your body to release something in your system called zonulin. And zonulin is a molecule that will actually poke holes in your intestine, leading to something called leaky gut. When we have gut inflammation or any sort of gut dysfunction, any degree of leaky gut, what that does is it actually prevents us from absorbing any nutrients from our food. And what we can extrapolate from that is our level of health and our level of function is literally just our ability to assimilate nutrients. If you are not getting adequate nutrients from your, from your food intake, and you are not living a healthy sort of lifestyle, you're going to 100% see decline in the hormone production, in the blood flow, and in your ability to actually regulate your nervous system because the gut actually plays a really, really big part in your nervous system function overall. I mean, we've all heard of the or felt the gut feelings and the gut responses that we get in certain situations. That's your nervous system living there and telling you information. Wow. I, I'm, you should actually see my jaws just dropped. Like I'm just hearing all this and I'm sure that listeners are getting the picture of just how many changes they could make. And, you know, as the, the listener, what we want to do is invite you to not get overwhelmed and then do none of it. Maybe make two changes that she has proposed to you. Start there and then add some more. But let's say they wanted some guidance and support. And now they heard you a few minutes ago say that their maybe typical general practitioner maybe hasn't really mastered the art of like seeing the bigger picture for this. So I think number one would be who can work with you? Um, Can people work with you if they're outside of Arizona? And then after you answer that, let's say they can't for some reason or they want to work with someone locally, what do you invite them to do in terms of like a certain kind of doctor to look for or a certain couple of requests like, hey, doc, I really want you to look into this and this because I heard about it. Yeah. So I can work with patients uh, definitely within the state of Arizona um, and we can do a lot here because I am fully licensed here. When it comes to uh, anyone who's out of state or even out of the country, I can act as a quote unquote health coach. So Uh, I can offer basically general guidance on different strategies to help improve your health, improve other aspects too. If you want, if you want to talk specifically about libido or whatever it is, we can definitely do that. Now, when it comes to looking for a provider, functional medicine doctors or doctors that have any sort of functional title in their name or whatnot, those are going to be ones to look for in addition to, of course, naturopathic doctors. And you can find those in pretty much any state. So there, there really isn't a shortage. The caveat I would want to say with asking your regular doctor to order those extra labs is they're not going to necessarily know what to do with the results once they get them. You want to be seeing somebody who can not only order the appropriate stuff, but then act on the results and then know how to troubleshoot as you go through your changes, right? Because the the last thing you want to do is go to this one doctor, maybe they make some changes, or maybe you try to kind of biohack it yourself, and then you have nobody there to support you through it or to help you when other things come up, which they are bound to do. Anytime we're tackling someone's health, we're always playing like an almost delicate game of Jenga where we're precariously moving things to be able to build you into something bigger and better without trying to topple anything else, right? We're, we're impacting your physiology, which is a total privilege that I am honored to do every single time I do it. And we really want to make sure that we're doing things strategically so that we are building you into the best version of yourself possible. I love that. And, and you know, if you're in Arizona, you just must see her. And even if you're not in Arizona, like really consider her as a health coach, someone who can guide the conversation with you. And I I really want to attest to working with naturopaths, with functional medicine doctors, because they spend more time with you and they actually ask like 
a wide range of questions to get to some of these kind of more hidden factors as opposed to just, I'm going to draw some labs, I'm going to make some assumptions, and I'm going to prescribe you something. So just really want to encourage any of you who've never seen a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor, more time with you, more thorough, and just a different angle than I mean, I'm, I know that there are a lot of great doctors out there, and I'm sorry if some of you listening are doctors, but it can be somewhat like med-driven as opposed to really holistic. So, Oh, I mean, one of the big things I just took away too, it's like, I don't want to go to a doctor that's going to shoot for me to be normal. I want a doctor that's going to shoot for me to be ideal mm. and optimal. Yes. I mean, that hit me. I'm like, normal? <laughs> I walk around the United States, I'm like, I don't want to be cl even close to normal. Right. And th that's exactly it. So these lab quote unquote reference ranges are based on the averages that these labs get. So you're literally being compared to the sickest of the sick because who's going to get labs? Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Whoa, that's a mic drop right there. <laughs> I mean, it's true, true. I mean, you know, I think everyone can acknowledge America. We've gotten a little lax. We've gotten a little... Uh, decadent in what is provided for us and in our suites and when like stress is at all-time high and you know cardiac disease and diabetes it's like please don't shoot for normal because mm -hmm. if we all shot for normal we all be dead at 40 years old mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you and you know I always just like to think about these moments where patients or people are encountering this information and it's really an opportunity for you to just try something else on right and I just like to think of it as go on this experiment with me, right? Just experiment. And if things don't change for you in a positive way, you are always welcome to go back to the way things were before. But once the veil has been lifted and you see what it's like on the other side, I mean, come join us. We're going to welcome you with open arms. Like there is so much, we're, there's a lot happening over here. We're having a great time. And I think you would want advice and wisdom from someone who has two great kids and a great sex life, having sex almost every day. I think that's the kind of advice a person you'd want to receive advice from. So. <laughs> I try that. I it, it matters to me to live in integrity and to go to dispel advice that I think is good enough for me to take myself. Yeah. And, and she's ultra healthy and fit too, by the way, which <laughs> not all doctors are. So, so Sabrina, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, your knowledge. I know that people hearing this are like, whoa, I really have a few actions and changes to make. And I think there's a lot here that people can work with. So thank you for your time. I'm so excited for everyone that gets the opportunity to work with her privately. You're just an extraordinary person. Oh, well, thank you so much. This was an honor, you guys. It was so fun. Oh, I'll talk to you soon.